I wanted to start uh, just by mentioning something that happened yesterday. Um, there are riots happening in my hometown, and uh, that's entirely predictable, I guess, uh, given the, uh, the nature of the place. What's not so predictable is what's going to happen uh, at, or what the reaction to that will be at MIT and Sorry, while well, I turn off my wireless so it just won't keep uh, asking. Um, I, I don't know if it's appropriate to mention that and say anything about it, but if you, I would just invite you to think about what you would do if it were your hometown and if it were, were your university that was being threatened with a removal of uh, federal funds because people are uh, speaking out about what they believe in. So, um, now to the uh, linguistics and the phonetics and the neuroscience. I'm going to talk a little bit about representations of speech. And um, I'd like to start this with a little bit of a kind of interactive thing. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but um, I'll depend on Josh to be the first one to speak up and say something to get things rolling. But my question is, uh, oh shoot. I deleted one of my slides because um, <laughs> I'm showing you my answers as well as my uh, question. The question is, what are the representations of speech that we use as uh, analysts, as scientists studying speech? And we come at speech from a lot of different points of view, and we all have representations. We represent the... Uh, speech material in different ways. So as engineers, uh, I've put up some things that I think engineers use to represent speech. Um, and I'd be interested to know if there are any engineers here who would like to add or revise. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to. So, so you're going to learn a representation from a digital waveform of speech? Transcription. Yeah, yeah. And so those are all representations. You know, even choosing that I'm going to um, pay attention to the digital waveform, there's a starting representation, and we build representations on top of representations, right? You had one. Um, much going to echo what Yashua said. And sometimes if we're feeling lazy, instead of going from the waveform, we'll go from something simple like a, a null spectrum. Right. But MFCCs are out. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Why are MFCs? Well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. Quinphones. What phones? Quinphones. Okay, <laughs> quinphones instead of triphones. Yeah. Yeah. Fundamental frequency. Right, so you'll put in fundamental frequency as well. The, instead of just a spectral representation, you'll uh, pick one particular component of the spectrum for special representation. I want to get to that. As an engineer, is that the represent? Yeah, I don't know if we have that as an option. Uh, phoneticians, are there phoneticians here? Stephanie. Uh, yeah, sure. What is the phoneticians' representation? Uh, an answer. Uh, cues, feature cues. Feature cues. So these are uh, phonetic properties, acoustic properties, is that right? Right. So we're, uh, phonetic acoustic properties that inform about uh, contrast. Other phonetic representatives, high tech. <laughs> I'm just picking people I know. So. <laughs> Of what's a phonetician used to represent speech? Yeah, the IPA <laughs> is a phonetic representation of speech. VOT. VOT, <laughs> right. We take a measurement and uh, use that. So I didn't put VOT. I had some other things. Formants. Uh, also, phoneticians actually look at how people talk, not just what it sounds like. And so we'll represent things as gestures or movements in articulatory uh, uh, traces and so on. Uh, linguists, 
are linguists different from phoneticians? Um, phoneticians know the answer is yes. <laughs> phoneticians are different from linguists. Linguists are different from phoneticians. Um, I'm not, are there any linguists in the audience? Ah, so what's the linguistic representation? Phonemes. I mean phonemes, yeah. And what, there's, there are more uh, linguistic representations than that, aren't there? No, they're not, no. Yeah. <laughs> so we have all sorts of stuff that we will use. Phonemes, allophones, uh, distinctive features are a linguistic representation. Um, Morphemes, so uh, a variety of different ways of representing speech. Now, psychologists have a representation of speech. Is that any different from any of these others? Like, any, of the above, what? What's, any, any of the above. Any of the above. You'll just take anything that. Uh, oh, yeah. So we could talk about exemplars of, uh, say, lexical items or, or whatnot. Uh, psychoacousticians also have a vocabulary for talking about uh, speech. Uh, we'll use the uh, spectrotemporal receptive field as a way of, talk, of representing what is a speech sound like in a psychological sense, in the psychoacoustic representation. We also have these models that talk about the organization of language, the cohort model or the merge model or the trace model as ways of representing speech. My main point here is that the, we find it useful to have a variety of representations as analysts looking at language. And in, our representations sort of depend on the task. You know, as a linguist, I can say, I don't understand why these engineers are so concerned with whatever it is they're representing language in. And engineers can look at linguists and say, I don't know why these linguists are so concerned with phonemes and allophones and so on. And it's basically like what kind of question you're trying to answer is part of what dictates what's a good representation, what's an insightful way of representing speech. So the question is whether the representation of speech for humans is also task-based, and that the representation that comes into play for language users depends on what sort of problem or what sort of task the user is uh, addressing uh, in their interaction with speech. As you use speech to accomplish something, uh, or to uh, work with speech somehow, you may have a different kind of representation. So, for example, kinds of tasks that humans could have for language. One is you have to learn language. And so there's a kind of learning task that may be different from a using task. And so adults will also uh, learn a language. Adults may need to learn new words and figure out how other people are pronouncing words and be able to uh, uh, incorporate those same words in their own speech. We also use language uh, maybe primarily just to communicate with each other. Once we have it in place, that's one of our main tasks. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, people use language, operate with language as a way of interacting socially. And so language is actually something that tells you about the other person, how they talk, how they choose to pronounce their words, um, all sorts of um, uh, properties of people that get into the phonetic representation of speech. So we try to identify the interlocutor and figure them out. And we also try to present ourselves in the best light um, so that we will fit into society. It's a social uh, property. I'm just going to talk today about uh, a couple of things. One is I'm going to talk about learning and communicating and how these two tasks might lead to different representations. And then in the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about context and some aspects of how the uh, context in which language is being used shapes what people expect to hear and how people talk. Um, so, learning new words and communicating, two different tasks. Lynn Blom and his colleagues in 1995 identified uh, 
two modes of listening. As a listener, if you're trying to learn a new word or if you're trying to figure out uh, what a person said and it's kind of unclear, you might go into what they called a how mode of listening. How did you say that sound? How did you say that word? You're trying to dissect the um, procedures that are involved in actually producing the word. And uh, in the process of communicating, our main task and our mode of listening is just to figure out what did that person say. You're just focusing on which word out of all the possible words, which message out of all the possible message was being delivered. And so you have a what mode versus a how mode. Um, when we think about models of speech perception, I'm putting this one up just because it's a really old and somewhat generic in a way. I don't know that the field has progressed much beyond a view um, that says you have some auditory input on one end and some output that is a string of uh, phonemes coming out the other end, and that's speech perception. And this kind of uh, sort of serial view of processing um, doesn't really accept alternate modes of listening, to say, well, I'm going to listen one way uh, as a, a how mode listener in one situation, as a what mode listener in the other. And these kinds of models, uh, sort of serial models, can occur, you know, they can be interactive, but they're still serial. Here's an old one by uh, Jay McClellan that suggests that as you hear a word, that might change what you hear at the phoneme level. So you can have these double headed arrows that tell you information is being passed uh, both up and down the chain from sensory input to message up at the top. And the idea that the way you process language coming in could differ depending on what the task is, is not really a part of the, the model. And so as we think about uh, methods or, or think about what it is that people use in representation, if you have just a purely communicative model, a model that just says, I'm interested in what word this person said, and that's the only task that the model is trying to account for, we're not really representing uh, the, or not considering the range of representations uh, that may go into language. I think that uh, in what listening, when you're trying to figure out what word the person said, you basically just need auditory information. And here, an acoustic signal, can, you can replicate what listening with an acoustic signal. When it comes to how listening, you have to have an articulatory map also. You have to think about now, what did the person do with their mouth? How did they make that sound? And this is where um, models that link to articulation come into play, where we think that listeners hear in terms of articulation. My point is, well, I said in my abstract, there was a point in my life where I thought there was the representation, and I had to pick. You know, what is the representation of, of uh, phonetic information? And you, there's got to be a right answer, and you have to just pick one. And I think now that... Um, uh, you know, just thinking about it a little further, maybe, um, that the uh, representation of language depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And that we could actually tip people over into a different mode of listening in the experiments and kind of push people around there. Um, I'm not going to talk about data on that. I don't think I have enough time. But uh, we have been collecting data in the lab uh, in, in, uh, uh, at Berkeley where... We basically are measuring uh, listeners' ability to detect phonetic variation as a function of the predictability of words in context. And there, the, the general finding is if a word is highly predictable in its context, and you could sort of guess what word it's going to be, listeners don't notice phonetic variation as much as if the word is unpredictable in its context. And so there's a, a tendency for a little bit more of the kind of how processing, a little more attention to detail in the phonetic signal when you don't actually, um, uh, can't guess what word is being spoken. I'd rather 
um, like to focus on interaction with other knowledge and how processing uh, um, phonetics and picking up the signal uh, in phonetics um, involves attention to semantic context and for my talk here I'll focus mainly on situational context. That the type of, the idea here is that we have all sorts of information and uh, information at different levels and the mixing of that information is an important characteristic. How does the situation change the way you um, process speech as a listener or as a talker where the representation of knowledge um, needs to uh, interact in ways that are not really part of a, a serial type of model. So I'm going to talk about two studies. Um, the first of these is by Jacqueline Palmer. Uh, both of these are really little studies with little hints of future research that should be done. They're both undergraduate honors theses at uh, Berkeley. And so they're the beginning points of uh, uh, interesting research, I think. So uh, Jacqueline Palmer uh, looked at uh, context for lexical recognition. She took uh, sentences like these from um, recorded conversations of English. So we just brought people into the lab and asked them to talk about stuff. And um, so Jacqueline uh, went through the recordings and found instances of the same person saying the same word four times. Two of the times had to be what she called a full production, where it had, these are three syllable words, uh, three or four syllable words, and these words um, in the full production had all their syllables, in a reduced production had at least one syllable missing. So people say things like similar for similar. And people say things like similar, uh, there it is, similar, uh, syllabic M for similar. Just in ordinary running speech, this stuff will happen. And so what she did was she uh, digitally spliced words out of context and put them in another context either a, full, a word from full context into another sentence in full context, or a word from full context into a context where the word had been reduced, and vice versa. So you get all the kind of possible splicings, uh, smooth over the pitch traces so it sounds like it could have fit in that context. And then uh, she did uh, ask listeners to monitor for those words. So this was kind of a word monitoring experiment so you'd see the word similar on the screen in front of you, and the task was push the button when you hear the word. How long does it take to detect that word? And the answer is, it depends on the context, particularly for the full targets, the ones that have all three syllables. If they're in the same context, same type of context, these were never in exactly the same context, they were always spliced, there was always something kind of hinky about uh, the uh, splicing. But uh, in a full context, the full targets are responded more quickly than in a reduced context. The reduced targets, the ones that had uh, um, only two syllables where the underlying representation or the, the standard form of the word had three, then you have virtually no difference between them. This is what that looked like with the error bars on it. So you can see that this is uh, reaction time data. There's a fair amount of variation in the data but we do get a, uh, uh, a, uh, an effect of whether the word matches its context or not. So here we have uh, the target word full uh, in the triangle, either in the context where it matched the type of uh, style of speech or it mismatched, and that made a big difference for the recognition of those words. Now, what that means is um, I mentioned style, and I, I want to call this effect, a style effect. This is how fast are you talking, what style of speech are you using, and when we splice a word out of one style of speech and put it into another, that can have an impact on how well you process it. The interesting thing to me about this is that this is a mixing of levels. You know, this is information about some aspect of the overall style of speech and word processing. So that's the part that's interesting. People have this 
expectation, this ability to predict um, what kind of form do I expect in this chunk of speech. And if the form doesn't match, at least for these uh, full, full words in a, a kind of reduced context, you get this style mismatch. And so style is a tuner, you know, an expectation tuner for what to expect words to sound like. And I think because this kind of style is um, uh, changing uh, over the course of an utterance fairly quickly, this is a kind of rapid adaptive tuning to the style of speech that you're hearing. So one other conclusion that I would draw from this is that this what mode, trying to figure out what a person is saying, uh, is uh, pretty detailed and is keeping track of details like the style of speech in context. Now moving to speaking and the role of the speaker in context, I'd like to highlight another uh, honors thesis by Priscilla Lau. Uh, she looked at the Lombard effect and titled her thesis, The Lombard Effect as a Communicative Process. So this experiment involved putting a listener and a talker in a communicative task where they were reading word lists to each other. And the listener had to write down the words that the talker was saying. And then they would trade roles and the talker would become the listener. And so they're just trading word lists. And in one condition, so they're on um, an intercom talking to each other. And when you push the button to talk, let's see, how did this work? The, the other person can hear your background noise. So I don't mean an intercom. I mean a microphone and some loudspeakers. And you've got room noise in some of these conditions. So we have, in some conditions, it's clear neither the speaker nor the listener is in noise. In another condition, both of the speaker and the listener are in noise. In another condition, only the speaker is in noise. That's kind of the typical Lombard uh, situation. And lastly, the, maybe the most interesting condition is the listener is in noise and the speaker is in the clear. When the speaker hears the listener, so the listener was instructed to uh, break in, push the intercom and say, could you please repeat that last word? And we gave them uh, an answer sheet that had stars next to the ones where they were supposed to ask for a clarification. When they did that, the speaker could hear the background noise that the listener was in. And so the speaker is not in noise, but the listener is. And the speaker knows that the listener is in a noisy environment. And so we're interested in knowing whether there's an, a, any hint of a Lombard effect for speaking to somebody who's in a noisy environment. The usual Lombard effect is the speaker's in a noisy environment, so they speak up. This is a case where we're testing for uh, the speaker's sympathy with the plight of the listener and whether they would respond in a way that corresponds to a Lombard type of effect, uh, even though they're not in noise themselves. Um, and the consequences of this uh, were measured in amplitude, vowel duration, and the acoustic vowel space. So these are the amplitude duration measurements. So we took the uh, no noise condition as the zero dB case, and then compared in decibels the other conditions to that. We get a fairly large uh, Lombard effect when both the speaker and listener are in noise, and then when the speaker is uh, in noise by himself, and a much smaller but a reliable uh, effect for the case where the listener is in noise. Measuring the duration of the vowels, these don't look like big differences, but they uh, were uh, consistent enough across uh, different vowel categories to show up as reliable. And this is like a 30 millisecond difference versus a 25. No, did I get that right? 15 and 20. So we have uh, relatively small but reliable differences in the duration of the vowels. When you look at the vowel space, you're just taking the plot of the corner vowels. We've got uh, the no noise condition in blue, and no vowels in particular. Uh, that's different from the other conditions, and the other conditions weren't different from each other. And so the size of the vowel space showed this effect of a response to the plight of the listener, even if it's just the listener in noise rather than uh, the speaker being in noise. 
And so this is an indication that as a speaker, uh, we adapt to the needs of the listener. There's some question in my mind whether this is an instance of uh, a kind of modulation of a representation, kind of choosing a different representation as a speaker, or if this is uh, purely a kind of uh, speaking process, say just opening the jaw more, making the, the speech louder with lower low vowels and so on. And so uh, this response uh, may not uh, have as much to say about representations of speech other than the interaction between a high level narration, how are things going for my listener, versus the phonetic uh, properties of speech being produced. So this is a quick talk. Uh, I'm doing all right? Okay. So um, my main point then is that many representations of speech are present and may be called on uh, to help us accomplish different speech tasks. Um, the neural question, uh, thinking about this from a processing point of view in the brain, is how contact gets made between different kinds of representation. Say how, how representations are modulated or changed in context, and also how representations that must be of different kinds of information uh, can interact with each other in real time during listening. And so I don't have answers to that. Uh, I hope that that lays out part of the, the sort of framework, uh, the questions that, that we might be addressing. I noticed several of the talks in the next couple of days have to do with these kinds of interactions among uh, information. And so, um, uh, hopefully this kind of sets the stage for some of these other talks.